Hello everyone, welcome to our group project for Nursing 450, Nursing Leadership and Professional Issues. My name is Christina and I will introduce our topic, which is Death with Dignity. The members of our group that will be presenting include Mariara, Joanne, Amanda, Jungmi, Den, Mark, and Caitlin. We will begin by introducing what Death with Dignity is and why it should be available for everyone who is suffering from a terminal illness. Death with Dignity is an end-of-life option for those who are suffering from a terminal illness who can legally request and obtain medication from their physician to end their life in a peaceful, humane, and dignified manner. This is an option for those who have less than six months to live. According to California's current legislation, terminal Ill, terminally ill people who are mentally competent are able to end their life through voluntary self-administration of medication that they can obtain from their physician. Those who are terminally ill should have the freedom to die a peaceful death at the time and place of their choosing, which can provide them with peace and comfort. There are currently five states that practice this law, include California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Vermont. We believe that all mentally competent, terminally ill patients should have the right to end intolerable suffering by choosing a dignified death in their own terms. Therefore, the Death with Dignity Act should be available to everyone. The following slides will provide further support for why we believe in this law. Hi, my name is Joanne. I will be discussing why we chose the human becoming theory to support our stance on Death with Dignity. Death with Dignity is largely about a patient taking control of their life and their care. When dying with dignity, a nurse should help support the patient's decision and help comfort the patient as the patient desires. That being said, the Human Becoming Theory by Rosemary Rizzo Parse was chosen as the theory to support our position on death with dignity. In this theory, the main goal of nursing is based on the patient's perspective of their quality of life. In this theory, the patient is responsible for their decisions that they make, and the patient is the expert in their own lives instead of the nurse. That, this is important when relating it to dying with dignity, as in the end, it is the patient's ultimate choice in how they are living out their lives and how they are choosing to end their lives. In this theory, there are three main themes, including mini, meaning, rhythmicity, and transcendence. Meaning is the patient has to discover their own meaning in the situation or healthcare predicament that they are in. In this case, it would be a terminal illness. Rhythmicity is the patient's values and ideals that are involved in developing the day-to-day -day patterns that sculpt their lives. This uh, rhythmicity helps the patient discover the meaning of their predicaments. In Death with, with Dignity, a person may consider the familiar patterns belief with religion or more. And lastly is transcendence, which is ultimately the person is choosing their path for themselves. In this case, it would be choosing dying with dignity. Through these three themes, the nurse is not trying to fix the patient, but rather they are trying to help guide the patient to find meaning, to find the rhythms and to find their ultimate choice. So the nurse is simply guiding them and not trying to fix them. <clears throat> so ultimately, the nurses guide and they ensure the person is living up to their highest quality of life. Overall, this theory ensures that a patient makes their own choice and has the highest quality of life. Hello, my name is Jungmi Kim. Um, California is one of four states that have that with dignity law, um, California, we call it the End of Life, Life Option Act. It is a law that permits terminally ill adult patient with the capacity to make medical decision to be prescribed as an aid in dying medication if certain conditions are met. The meeting certain conditions can, um, can be difficult due to um, patients' altered mental status due to depression or um, due to um, medications or um, each patient is suffering uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. So um, 
the one um, the physicians need to be careful um, evaluating the candidate for this um, option. Research evidence. Um, we want to look into some definitions of these phrases and terms. Mental competency. Competency as the court determination of an individual's sustained capacities for global or particular choices. For example, medical decisions at large. Capacity, on the other hand, as the um, clinical assessment of a decision-making ability for a particular intervention, such as withdrawal of a life-sustaining treatment. Terminal illness is an incurable disease that cannot be adequately treated and is reasonably expected to result in death of the patient within a short period of time. Period of time. Intolerable suffering. Physical suffering is not the most prominent dimension of suffering. Rather, psychological, social, and spiritual suffering appears to affect patients' greater aspect. What does it mean by dignified death? It's simply maintaining personal control and comfort with the approaching end of life. Death with dignity is a legal way for ter uh, terminally ill individuals to request and receive medication that can be used to hasten death at a time and place a patient's desires. So for my portion, I did the, I interview a person named Rachel. She's a friend of mine in Sacramento. And she's working for as a hospice nurse for Mercy Hospice Care Program, which is kind of linked to uh, Dignity Health. Um, the mission statement for the Mercy Hospice is certified and licensed to provide Medicare and Medi-Cal patients hospice services to patients throughout the region, as well as patients with other types of private insurance. Individuals without any financial means to obtain hospice care are also considered with different services paid through donations from Dignity Health Sacramento Mercy Foundation. They do provide uh, flexibility for hospice care patients for Sacramento region, and they work with all ages and terminal illnesses. They do support families and friends during difficult times. So besides the patient, they do support other people around, um, around them. And some of the interview questions related to the California End of Life Option Act. So my, so my friend, Rachel, she supports this act, but it depends on each um, hospice nurse opinion, and they do have to follow protocols and policies regardless of their opinion. Now, the California End of Life Act is based on the physician decisions of patients' life expectancy less than six months or less, or declining functional status. So the minimum age is 18 years old, and if a patient indicate their wishes to participate in the app, the physician, the patient physician must be notified as soon as possible so they can honor the wishes or based on the decision they make, they will speak to the patient. Uh, the hospice nurse may have to coordinate with chaplain, ministry, priest, or spiritual advisor to meet the spiritual needs of the patients and their family. Clinical skills in and competency that are useful as a hospice nurse is patience, flexibility, empathy, analytical skills, and pain management skills. Nurses may have to choose to switch to different assignments if they feel uncomfortable. Hospice uh, patient load is usually five to eight patients per day, but it varies on the employer. So for my friend Rachel, she has about five to eight, but she really says that it depends um, certain agency has or hospitals, hospital affiliated has less than five and some are more than 10. So it really depends. So, all right, thank you. Hello everybody. This is Caitlin Walker and this is my contribution to our group project, uh, Dying for Dig with Dignity. 
I interviewed Dr. Irinkes. She is a palliative care physician at Huntington Memorial Hospital. Um, pictured here on the right is Dr. Irinkes in the middle in the blue, and surrounding her is the whole palliative care team. Um, I asked Dr. Irinkes questions uh, varying from what exactly a palliative care physician does to any advice that she would give for anyone considering palliative care. One thing that I have learned from Dr. Enriquez was that palliative care physicians' main focus is preventing and alleviating suffering. Uh, they concentrate on improving quality of life and helping patients and their loved ones cope with the stress and burdens of their illnesses. Uh, they have special training in ex and expertise in pain management and symptom control. They also specialize in helping patients and their families cope with the many burdens of serious illnesses, um, from side effects of medical treatments, to caregiver stress, to fears about the future. Uh, the palliative care team can assist with various things and difficult medical decisions, helping weigh the pros and cons of various treatments. The most challenging aspect of um, being a palliative care physician was providing care to patients who qualify for palliative care and not being able to meet all their needs. Also competing with uh, the myths um, of thinking that their illnesses can be cured. It's kind of helping them cope with um, the reality of things. Also um, planning for advanced care, shared decisions, curative, stuff like that. Um, the most rewarding part of palliative care for Dr. Enriquez was being able to um, share life with these patients, to be able to find joy in the um, darkness. Uh, Dr. Enriquez has a few um, tips for anyone who is uh, thinking about palliative care. First, she wants you to know that it's a multidisciplinary approach. As shown here in the picture once again, uh, these other coworkers of mine are pastoral cares and social workers and care coordinators. She said that also it, it takes a whole team of other people, um, hospice nurses, home health nurses, um, as well as other doctors. She also um, suggests that you talk with people in palliative care first before pursuing it. She, she said it could uh, be quite difficult to go through end of life care with patients and you have to be able to find the joy in the work. Um, having that challenge to, is difficult, especially with managing symptoms, um, also with mental illnesses and complex family dynamics. Um, the, being a palliative care physician requires um, not only being a doctor, but being compassionate and thorough and comfortable with being transparent. And she says that we, uh, you have to definitely be advocates for your patient. It also requires people with good boundaries and a healthy sense of their own counter transference. Um, fellowship in palliative medicine is in a way a reprogramming for physicians away from the traditional medical approach to these challenging situations. And that's it for my um, slide. Thank you very much. Proposed action items. This is to be presented to the state lawmakers because in the United States, it's the states, not the federal government that licenses physicians and determine what is and what is not legitimate medical practice. The current physician assisted dying laws mirror the successful Oregon's Death with Dignity Act, which is widely successful and provides safeguards to protect patients and prevents misuse. The law permits a lethal prescription to aid in dying in specific circumstances, as stated above. The law provides immunity for physicians. Physicians under the law are not considered assisting in a suicide. The law gives them immunity in these cases. Physicians can refuse to participate, and their names are coded for privacy on the death certificate if they do choose to participate. The privacy of these patients is protected under HIPAA. Patient information is never released to the public. 
The death certificate lists the underlying disease as the cause of death. It is not considered a suicide, and patients and families are protected from discrimination. The law states that physician-assisted death will not affect life, health, or accident insurance, and it is not reported as a suicide on the death certificate. Respect for patients' autonomy is paramount. Patients want the right to say, that is not how I want to live. They want the right to control how and when their life will end. If we have the right to live with dignity, we should have the right to die with dignity. The physicians respect the patient's choice and fulfills the obligation of non-abandonment. It is an act of compassion on the physician's part. Intolerable suffering robs a person of their dignity. Medical science prolongs the life to a point of unnecessary suffering. Physicians, family, and patients spend too much money and place too much pressure on a cure when there is no chance for recovery. And turning off a ventilator versus a prescription for lethal drug dose is one and the same. Both are considered direct causes of the patient's death. The photo is of Brittany Maynard, who moved to Oregon in 2014 when she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She knew that she chose wanted to choose the right to die on her own terms in Oregon would allow her to do that. She was a big advocate for death with dignity. 54% of medical doctors are in favor of physician assisted dying. Unfortunately, many physicians who support the end of life option are reluctant to declare so publicly for fear of consequences. The vast majority think that of sorry, of patients and the public think that assisted death is ethically justifiable in certain cases, most often those cases involving unrelenting suffering. And it's an individual's choice on how they should die. Please listen to these stories of patient suffering and their wish to die with dignity on the website. Please help support this legislation to pass the Death with Dignity Act. I would like to review some of the current and ongoing arguments against the Death with Dignity Act. And this is reviewing some of the evidence from the four states that have similar legislation with safeguards for physician-assisted dying, which offers um, the waiting period of um, 15 days between double attempts of oral and written requests for physician assistance in terminally ill conditions to seek this aid in dying. Um, the main arguments are the incompatible that keep coming up even with this legislation are that incompatibility exists with the role as a healer. The um, physician notably takes the um, oath to do no harm, um, and which providing a, a prescription that hastens death um, violates this. Um, also, the devaluation of human life is a concern especially with people who work with the dying in the hospice areas. Um, this is a concern that we may view life as less meaningful when we offer this and uh, people a, a way out. What we healthier individuals may perceive as prematurely to view this as suicide. Um, again, I think it is a extension of patient's autonomy and a right to, to um, choose their own treatment so that this is an extension of, and we have to remember that focus. Um, there's a risk, the so-called slippery slope, that physician-assisted death will be used beyond a narrow group of terminally ill patients, and that's why the legislation of Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California includes elaborate safeguards um, addressing capacity and diagnosis, opt-outs, witnesses, and patient requests. Um, also, their mm, coercion of vulnerable individuals has been a compelling argument since the beginning of this legislation that really needs further analysis. Those vulnerable issue individuals um, are the psychiatric patients. Um, the issue is elaborated in an article about uh, psychiatry and the law. Um, Depression may be higher among the terminally ill or other psychiatric diagnoses as well, but it's a matter of the, what came first. Was the patient depressed and more likely to seek an early death because they're ill or during their treatment or what? That's why the, um, the time legislation of 
double requests, one written and one two oral, are important safeguards against that. And capacities being compromised and cognitive impairment. Of course, as nurses, we see fluctuations um, of lucidity and confusion, delirium, due to the illnesses that these patients are experiencing or the medications and treatments. Lack of education can make patients vulnerable to being encouraged towards a premature demise, um, and that's been uh, collected data on um, and reported. Um, so those subject to social prejudice, demographics are definitely a concern that we may unfairly target certain ethnic minorities, certain professions, certain portions of the population, and that um, deserves scrutiny. Um, vulnerable individuals, people have been conditioned to think of themselves as somehow less deserving of care, and I cite instances of urban versus rural differences in healthcare or treatment and availability in systems, as well as insured versus uninsured patients, um, people within our society. Also, HIV and AIDS patients, um, they kind of span a spectrum of those last two um, in terms of social prejudice and access to health care. Do insurance companies have a vested interest in perhaps um, offering um, an early death to HIV AIDS patients who may live um, increasingly longer lifespans due to anti-retro uh, to retroviral medications? Um, certainly just many ongoing concerns that have been reported annually in the state of Oregon since 1997. The latest report of 2017 data, um, which was published this year, shows that patients tend to be predominantly white, 94%. So concerns that ethnic minorities are, so is not as proved out to be valid over the last 20 years. Um, also, 49% of the Oregon reporting shows a bachelor's degree education, um, showing that people are maybe not victimized through ignorance into choosing this, that people are knowingly walking into this knowing their full options um, and choosing that dignified death option. And from the beginning of their reporting, there has been a steady decline in HIV AIDS patients to the point that there were actually none in 2017, maybe reflecting that patients are li living longer and healthier lives. Um, and interestingly, for the insurance perspective, patients don't seem to be choosing um, physician-assisted death because of lack of uh, medical options. Two-thirds of patients had medic Medicare insurance and almost a third had private, leaving maybe two, one to two percent of the patients use utilizing these services in Oregon last year that actually did not have good coverage. So in conclusion, patients are choosing, appear to be choosing physician-assisted death knowingly with their eyes open and in a lucid state with all of these safeguards. So I present that for you too as the concerns and issues that still exist with this in terms of encouraging other states to follow suit. Hello everyone, my name is Mayara Adams and I'm doing the conclusion portion of this project. In conclusion, we believe that we have the right to live with dignity and if this right is not achievable due to unbearable health conditions, we should be the ones responsible for choosing when enduring with sickness through life is no longer desirable. Therefore, to die with dignity is another right we need to guarantee. We need to fight and protest for these guarantees, which will provide us with comfort during the suffering that many dying patients experience in their last days. We strongly believe that the Death with Dignity Act should be legal in all 50 states for those who are mentally competent and terminally ill adult state residents to receive assisted dying from a doctor. This meaning that a patient will be in comfort during their passing by going in peace, maintaining physical integrity, and have their wishes respected on their own terms. 
The Human Becoming Theory by Rosemary Rizzo Pars focuses on the quality of life as desired and to be believed by the patient. It urges us to understand that we are the ones whose voice needs to be listened to when we believe that our current state of health is no longer attainable. According to the theory and the goal of nursing, is based on the patient's perspective of their own quality of life. Our proposed action item appeal that in the US, it is the states, not the federal government, that licenses physicians determine what is, and it's not legitimate medical practice. According to Death with Dignity, 54% of physicians are in favor of physician-assisted dying However, they fear to make public statements due to retaliation.